Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to share with you what I learned last year's Fluid Academy Day in the afternoon sessions, which was on hemodynamic uh, monitoring. I have to disclose that I have some possible uh, conflicts of interest, uh, which are listed there. Whenever we are confronted with a patient, um, there may be therapeutic conflicts or dilemmas. At some point, we may to choose to give fluids so that the kidneys are well perfused and the patient passes urine. But at some point, too much fluids may be dangerous for the lungs. So what I would like to do with you today is, um, after a very brief introduction, go into an interactive case discussion. And remember, it's all about the voting and the points and the iPad at the end. Risks of fluids. I heard in the previous talk by Xavier that indeed at the bedside, and I'm a clinician, that's true, I'm not a university professor, we need to find answers to four basic questions. When do I start giving fluids? When do I stop? When do I start to empty the patient? And when do I stop to empty the patient? It's all about finding the balance of the benefits of fluids, the risks of fluids, the benefits of emptying the patients, and the risks of fluid removal. So we need to see more than others. We need to see more than just a simple central venous pressure. In the case I would like to present to you, it's finding this balance between the initial phase of, of shock where we heard this morning that goal-directed therapy may be beneficial and the later states of shock where the patient will accumulate uh, fluids and ending up with a positive fluid balance. So it's about finding the balance of the fluid balance. So this is a man, 26 years old, who was admitted to the ICU. Previous history we retained that he had oxygen debt during birth. He had a CVA with left hemiparesis, known with epilepsy, it was a partial epilepsy, and he resided in a special daycare institution. He was also known from the age of 17, so about nine years, with an idiopathic cardiomyopathy and an injection fraction of around 50%. So the reason for his admission now was that he developed general seizures but they were different from before he had The syncope, he didn't regain consciousness, he was admitted to the emergency department and there the emergency physician thought that there was a ventricular uh, tachycardia, so he got a biphasic shock and was transferred to the ICU for mere babysitting overnight. So the patient was stable at the time, neurologically fully recovered, no seizures. So what happened with this patient who was just admitted for monitoring and we hope to discharge him the next morning, Overnight, he uh, evolved uh, respiratory insufficiency. There was a gradual increase.
is in supplemental oxygen needs from 2 liter up to 15 liters with non rebreeding mask. We had to put him on non invasive ventilation. This he failed because it was difficult to communicate. And we had finally to intubate and mechanically ventilate him. And this happened only 18 hours after the admission for just mere babysitting. So the X ray at that time showed bilateral infiltrates quite profound on both lungs. So after the intubation, he became hemodynamically unstable. CVP was around 16, mean arterial pressure 51. And on the conventional ventilator with the Evita, we tried to have some lung protective ventilation, but we were not able to obtain a good oxygenation with a PF ratio of 74. So what do you do? Well, we did a cardiac ultrasound and we started to learn this as intensivists in our ICU. We found a dilated heart, ejection fraction around 30, and a severe mitral regurgitation. If you want other dimensions, the left atrium was distended above six centimeters. And other calculations that you can do with the ultrasound showed a fair cardiac index, a low ejection fraction, fractional shortening, a very large left ventricular and diastolic area, E over E prime of 15, resulting in a left ventricular and diastolic pressure of 25, and a vena cava inferior of about 21 with the mitral regurgitation and some slight pulmonary hypertension. So this patient seems as having a very bad heart. So this is my first question. Knowing the data of the cardiac ultrasound, and they are summarized there, what would be your treatment of choice? And we can go to the voting questions. So you can choose between norepinephrine, blood pressure was low, dobutamine, there was some lactate, a fluid bolus, maybe, diuretics or any other treatment. And remember, I want to see the number in the right upper corner going up to maybe now your 170. So please vote. Just give you some more time in order to digest the fluids and the food. Okay. If you don't know by now, your patient died. We move on with the case. And we can see the results. Okay, so it's interesting. So most of you trust the ultrasound. It's a poor heart. Um, norepinephrine fluids. Where are the brave ones? Raise your hands. Where are the 9% giving fluids to these patients? Come on. Just one, two, three. That's not 9%. You're cheating. <laughs> okay. We move on with the case. So what did we do? Well, we were confronted with a very poor oxygenation. So we did what we learned is perform a PV loop, low flow on the Evita. And we found an inflection point, hmm, maybe 15, 16. So the best peep would be around 18 centimeters of water in this patient. So we tried to do that, but that was very difficult. We choose for norepinephrine and a little bit of dobutamine, not too much, just a little bit. Norepinephrine was swiftly increased up to 0.4 gamma. FeO2 was up to 100%, and while setting the peep, while doing a recruitment, systolic blood pressure dropped. And remember this, this is a hallmark of something. Saturation remained poor, and we had to switch him on high frequency percussive ventilation, which in our hospital we use the VDR4. So what do you do then? Well, he was a bit stable with the norepinephrine, so we put a PICO. The PICO cardiac index was uh, confirmed, the one we observed with cardiac ultrasound, but I want you to look very closely on the right-hand side to the transpulmonary thermodilution curve very closely and think of yourself, is this a nice curve, is it an ugly curve? The volumes seem quite okay, but pulse pressure variation, sinus tachycardia was high and passive leg raising, and we have the specialist here, Professor Monet, was positive with, as defined, a 15% increase in cardiac index. But, a very, very big but, because extravascular long water normal values or listed there, up to seven, is tremendously increased. This may say that the patient intravascularly may be fluid responsive, but if we give fluids, it may end up 
in a deadly pulmonary edema. So this is the dilemma, again, a therapeutic conflict. What do you want to do? These are the values, and he's on high-frequency percussive ventilation. So the filling pressures are quite high, and the rest you saw. We can now go to the voting. So the same question, you can choose between a vasopressor, dobutamine, fluid bolus, diuretics, or anything else. I want to see the number on the right, upper corner, quickly, very fast, vote up to about 150, I think, with the voting pad here. Vote! Don't be shy. Okay. There are still some people either don't know your patient died again. So, this is interesting. This is really very interesting. So most of you now are convinced to diarize the patient. Where are the brave people? There are a little bit more with the fluids. Raise your hand. Who's willing to give fluids? Okay. Not everyone is exposing himself, but we move on. Most of you were scared in this therapeutic dilemma and choose to save the lung. The lung seems to be flooded with a very high extravascular lung water. But if you look at algorithms, and this is the basis of protocolized care, you can see that our patients fitted here. A good cardiac index, the volume was okay, global and diastolic, but the extravascular water was high, so the algorithm would say fluid removal, which is diuretics, which is what you all voted. But how can we explain the relative discrepancy between the volumetric, which is the global and diastolic volume, and the barometric, which is the CVP, in these patients. And remember that the guidelines surviving sepsis campaign tell us to target CVP up to 8 or 12. But chasing blindly this st static CVP threshold may lead to over or under resuscitation, and a high CP CVP may be related to an increased intrathoracic pressure. Remember, he had a high PEEP, and he had an abdominal pressure of 11, which is not so far increased, but Studies shown that if you increase abdominal pressure, it will increase the CVP, while it will decrease volumetric preload indices. So I'm still not sure about the fluid status of this patient, but I have to admit, I have been unfair because I did not tell you that the inferior vena cava collapsibility index was about 50%. Okay. So what we, did we do? we decided to fill the patient because of the high PPV, the passive flag raising, and the inferior vena cava collapsibility index. But, of course, we were afraid we are humans, so we decided to give him a small volume resuscitation with hypertonic colloid at a dose of 4 ml per kilo and some balanced colloids. Not sure whether it's good or bad, but that's what we did. So the next morning, what we observed is with the fluids, an increase in the volumetric preload indicator. Extra vascular lung water, I'm not sure what happened here, but it decreased, mean arterial pressure stabilized. And the CVP with the filling decreased, which is really berserk. So overnight, the respiratory support was kept with the high frequency percussive ventilation and he did not need the nitric oxide, which was done by. So on the next morning, we saw a drop in extravascular lung water, oxygenation went better, and maybe already a slight improvement in the chest X-ray. So with this therapeutic dilemma, we choose to give fluids because the PPV was high and the passive leg raising was positive, and the global and diastolic volume was relatively low in view of the very poor global ejection fraction and despite increased CVP area and extravascular lung water. So what I really want to know is if you believe in Frank Starling, what is the curve and where is my patient on the curve? So if you would correct the global endostolic volume for the ejection fraction, then you may be able to compare apples with apples. Imagine this patient with a very dilated heart. If this patient loses 30% of circulating volume in the setting of a high gastrointestinal bleeding, if you look at the heart, even with an echo, the volume will still be large, but this patient at that moment in time will be fluid responsive.
So it's all about knowing the ejection fraction in correlation to the global and diastolic volume. And you can follow me that when ejection fraction is low, the resting global and diastolic volume will be increased. So a poor heart will be a dilated heart with an increased volume. So pressures as preload, if you look at changes in pressures over changes in stroke volume, there is no relation. And we were a bit disappointed that in our mixed ICU population, we could not find a good relation between changes in volumetric preload and changes in cardiac index. But when we corrected the volumes for the ejection fraction, then we were able to find a good correlation. So comes the next question, and this is a favorite of uh, Friedrich Michard. I told you to pay very well attention to the transpulmonary thermal dilution curve, and it may look like a camel. That's why Frederick called it the camel curve. So here comes the next question, and we can have a vote. The premature hump that we see, well, there's nothing wrong. It's just an example of the crosstalk phenomenon. Two, it's related to a thermal bolus mixing. Three, it may be an indicator of a right to left shunt. Four, it's a wrong or false measurement, or you may not know, and it's not a shame if you don't know. I want the number at the right upper corner very, very quickly increased up to 150, so please vote, push the button. Easy option, five, push five if you don't know, but vote. Okay, we see the answers. Okay, and that is interesting. Frederick, I think they read your papers. Let me explain. This is a patient who is severely underfilled with a global endostolic volume of 288, normal values being 640, 650. And this is after one voluven, and you can see the time, it's only 20 minutes. Here you see a premature hump, and here it disappeared. And remember, our patient had a high level of PEEP. So what happens if there is pulmonary hypertension? This may induce an open foramen ovale in an amount of our patients, which will create a shunt from right to left. So the rest of your bolus will come later, and this results in a transpulmonary thermal dilution curve with this double hump. And Frederick showed that if you put PEEP, you can induce a right to left shunt. If you return to ZEEP, it disappears. And if you put a PEEP again, it will increase. Remember, our patient became extremely hypotensive when we were recruiting him. So what probably happens in the setting of hypovolemia is that you have zone one of west excursions to position two and from two to three. And if you then add a high PEEP, you will have zone one conditions where you would normally expect zone three conditions, and this may trigger a right to left shunt. So next day, the problem is that urine output drops at only 350 mLs, and at that point, global anastolic volume is high and extravascular lung water increased. So comes the next question now, another dilemma. The kidneys are in a poor shape. So please, you can vote. High extravascular long water, high global and diastolic volume. Can I have uh, the question? It's always the same. At this stage, day two, will you go for norepinephrine, dobutamine, fluid bolus, diuretics, or something else? You can vote. Please vote. Vote, 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 vote. Vote quick. Vote. Yes. <laughs> Okay, 130, 140. We can finalize the vote. And now I think we are getting there. Who are still the brave ones who want to give fluids? Can you please raise your hand? Uh, I'm getting shy. Why would you give fluids at this stage? You try it. You try it until. Okay, well, it's fair to try until the patient is drowned or... Okay, I'm just kidding. We choose for the majority, which was combination of a PEEP setting to put the fluids out of the alveolus 
with the hypertonic albumin combined with furosemide in a time frame of each 30 minutes. And we gave again some hypertonic uh, solutions in a small volume resuscitation setting. And this is what happened with the diuretics and again recruiting and the albumin is that we are now able to clear the fluids out of the lungs and out of the patients. So the next day on day three, we continued with the albumin, the PEEP was already set and the diuretics. On day four, you can see that extravascular comes down, norepinephrine has been stopped, ventilation goes better. And then you think, okay, it's going better with the patient and we remove the high frequency percussive ventilation and we put him on conventional. And then the next day, again, two white lungs with an extravascular lung water increasing up to 16. So we're just basic clinicians, so we do the things we know that the patient would respond to is again the PEEP setting and the frosomide PEEP set according to PV loops at 19. And you see the next day, we were able again to chase the fluids out of the lungs. And over the next course of days and after one week, we were able to wean the patient and extubate the patient. So comes to my last question, which is, what do you believe is correct with regard to a positive cumulative fluid balance? Peripheral edema may look frightening for the relatives, but it's just a cosmetic concern. Fluid balance must be positive because you have to resuscitate a patient with shock. Patients don't die from anasarca, they die from organ failure. A cumulative fluid balance is biomarker and a positive cumulative fluid balance is independent predictor or none of the above. You can vote. Whenever there is a question, you can already vote right away if you think you know the answer. Okay, some more. Okay. We can show the answer. I Okay, fair enough. Evolution of the patient chest X-ray where you can see where we uh, put him on Evita in red, high frequency percussive in uh, green yellow, and in yellow here is the diuresis. So you can see that there is a nice uh, evolution whenever the patient was recruited on high frequency and diurized. On two occasions, we opted for de-resuscitation on day two and then on day four and five. And this is the urine output and the uh, fluid balance negative on day two and five. Initially, by filling the patient, you see the volumetric preload increasing while CVP came down. And you see with the diuresis that the extravascular lung water came down. So just to give you some information on a metrical analysis, as an introduction, survivors do have a less positive fluid balance and cumulative fluid balance is less positive in survivors as well. That's interesting, yes. I believe that the positive cumulative fluid balance is not only of cosmetic concern. They took the nurses because they have a nursing session. I was thinking there would be no timekeepers, but uh, they took them out of the nursing session. I didn't expect that. A meta-analysis shows that um, a positive cumulative fluid balance is related to outcome. And if you intervene and do restrictive uh, treatment, then uh, your patient is more likely to survive. And this brings me to a three hit model of shock where the targets change from hemodynamics to organ function and the goals change from early adequate goal directed to late conservative fluid management to late goal directed fluid removal with the fluid balance going from positive over zero to negative. Okay, I have to skip this one and it was already alluded to the Paul treatment results in a better survival and a faster weaning. Wrap it up. This is my last slide. What I really wanted to know at the beginning is when do I start to give fluids? When do I stop? When do I start to empty? When do I stop to empty? So it's all about the risk of fluids and the risks of uh, emptying the patient. So I start giving fluids based on volumetric preload and functional hemodynamics. 
I stop when these increase and passive flag raising is no longer positive. I start to empty when I have...